Okay. Um, one other change, things are always changing. I had suggested that, of course, we started out with introduction to the historical books of the Bible and the book of Joshua. Last, yeah. last week we deal, dealt with Judges and Ruth. This week we're talking about 1st and 2nd Samuel, and next week 1st Kings and 2nd Kings. And then um, I, I had said we were going to have 1st Kings one week and 2nd Kings the ne next week, because there's a lot, a lot of sort of background stuff related to that in terms of the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the, you know, the destruction of the two kingdoms and all of that. But as I've thought about it and gotten more into the preparation for it, I've decided I'm going to do 1st and 2nd Kings together. And then First and Second Chronicles, and that really makes sense because um, our divisions of Samuel's Kings and Chronicles into two books—it's not originally written like that. Originally, in the Jewish version, the Tanakh, um, those are each one books. There's a book of Samuel, a book of Kings, and a book of Chronicles. And so we will deal with those together. In fact, it, I'm going to give you an outline today of uh, First and Second Samuel, and it's one outline. I have a line drawn as to where the two, the books are broken. But the original Jewish, there was no separation. The first time formally that a separation was made was when the, um, the Greek translation the, was made of the ancient Jewish scriptures, the Septuagint, in um, about, well, 300s, um, which is 4th century, um, 300s BC, before Jesus, okay? And one of the reasons that they believe that they began to break some of these books up into smaller books is because originally when they were all on scrolls, it was very hard to have one scroll that's that long. And so they split them up because you could put it on two scrolls and it makes it much easier to take them down, put them in a, you know, the scroll rack and read them. So anyway, we'll deal with 1st and 2nd Samuel this week, 1st and 2nd Kings next week, 1st and 2nd Chronicles on the 5th week, and then we'll deal with Ezra and Nehemiah, the return and rebuilding. And because it's such a wonderful story, and there's a lot of stuff we can deal with that as well, because it involves um, Persia. You know, it's where Persia comes into the picture, the kingdom of Persia. Um, we'll deal with the book of Esther in the first hour of week seven, and then we will deal with the final exam. And again, I encourage everyone to take the final exam. By week five, I will have for you everything you need to know, papers, and you can study all that material. Any questions about any of that? And you're all going to be here at 3 o'clock next week, right? Yes. right. Hopefully yes. I will be too. Um, all right. I'm going to use this chart every week because it's a helpful way for us to understand the structure of the Old Testament according to the English Old Testament. The Hebrew Tanakh, as you know, has all the same material, but it's in a different order. It's broken up differently, whereas we call these the historical books. These are what we're studying. <laughs> They actually take uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings and call them prophetic books. They don't have a category called history. They're called the former prophets. And then when they get into these that we call the major prophets, they call those the latter prophets. And then all 12 of the minor prophets are in one book in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh. It's called the Book of the Twelve, which is why they have a lot fewer books, not because they have any less information, but they break it up differently. So, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, 66 books in total. All right? So, we're working right here. We will have, after this, in the future, one more Old Testament class as part of our curriculum. I don't think it's even listed. Uh, I've been adjusting some things, and I don't think this change has been made. We will have uh, one class on the books of wisdom. So, we will look at Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, it's often called. Um, as a separate class. That will be next term. The sixth term, somebody was just asking me for class, will be in April, May. Exact dates I'll have to get back to you on. But April and May, those two months, will be those classes. We'll deal in the Old Testament with the books of wisdom. In the New Testament, we'll deal with the, the, the Catholic epistles, as they're called, and the book of Revelation. The Catholic epistles are all of the letters of the New Testament that are not by Paul. Catholic means universal. All of Paul's letters were written to a church or to a group of people or to an individual. So they're specific. All of the letters from Hebrews up until Revelation are called the Catholic epistles because Catholic means universal. They weren't written to a specific church or a specific person. They were written to everybody. And so we'll study 
the Catholic epistles and the book of Revelation as the New Testament class next time, and then systematic theology too. That will be the term that is April, May. Okay? I'll get out the other stuff here, but you get the idea. This is the prophet Samuel, and as we're going to talk about here, um, there, there are three main characters in the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel. Uh, Samuel. Samuel was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. Samuel is one of the most important people in the Bible, and yet he doesn't get nearly as much credit as he should. There's no question that the three most important people in the Old Testament are Abraham, to whom the covenant was given that created the, the people of Israel, um, the, and then Moses, the lawgiver, and then King David, who created a nation. Now, you could say Saul, but Saul didn't do nearly as much. We'll look at a map later. David was the great king. And so Abraham, Moses, and David get all the credit, and they deserve it. But right under them, at the top of the next tier of major players in the Old Testament, Samuel would have to be one of the top two or three. And yet, people don't often think about him. Um, Samuel is responsible for the transition one of the most important transitions in the history of the Hebrew people, the transition from um, a loosely knit group of tribes under the judges to being a united country under the monarchy. Samuel was the one that God raised up and anointed and guided in making that transition. He ended the period of the judges, he began the period of the united monarchy, and was the first of the great prophets of the Old Testament. I mean, Moses was actually a prophet, so you'd have to count him. But in terms of later prophets, Samuel was a major player. And yet, we don't often think about Samuel as being a major figure. You will notice that in almost every picture of Samuel, he has a horn. What's up with the horn? There's always some meaning when you see icons, and these are all icon versions of images of Samuel. Um, there are always, you always see Peter having keys because he was given the keys to the kingdom by Jesus. You always have Paul holding a book because of his writings. Samuel is holding a horn because that's what they carry oil in in the Old Testament. In fact, in 2 Samuel, when God is sending um, Samuel to find David and anoint him, God says, take up your horn, fill it with oil, and I will show you who is to be the next king of Israel. And so that horn is uh, a symbol of the fact that Samuel was, was the one through whom God anointed the kings of Israel. Okay? At least the first two, Saul and then David. David being the great king. All right? Um, he's a major player, and he's a very cool guy. You know, Samuel is... is Perhaps the only major character in the Old Testament, I'm, I'm, I'm having to think real quick here, I may be wrong about this because it's off the top of my head, but he certainly is one of the very few characters in the Old Testament that did not have any major faults or flaws or a major fall. I mean, we get somebody as great as, as uh, you know, Moses committed some acts of disobedience that prevented God from, uh, that kept God from letting him go into the Promised Land. Abraham, of course, lied about his wife. Uh, and there's some other things Abraham did. How about Joseph? Um, Joseph, yeah, Joseph would probably qualify for that as well. Yeah, Joseph is a good guy. Um, I, I, that's why I said I'd have to think about this. He's one of few. Sam, David, you know, the, the affair with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah, her husband, a horrible thing. Samuel had a clean slate. You know, he, um, he's a good guy and one people need to know more about. Okay? Um, let's talk about, I'm going to talk about separately the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel initially, and then we will get into um, a chronology of the major players. As I say, there are three major players in these books. There is Samuel, and in fact the significance of Samuel is somewhat demonstrated by the fact that David and Saul and David, the other two major characters in the books of Samuel, um, we don't know anything about their births. We meet them, you know, uh, Saul is a young man. David is a boy probably of about 15, but we don't know anything about their births. We know who their parents were because they always tell us that. But Samuel, we know everything about his birth. We even know about the circumstances leading up to his birth. That's where 1 Samuel starts out, is the story of, of his mother, <coughs> Hannah, who was unable to give birth. She prayed to the Lord. He gave her that blessing. 
So Samuel is important enough that we get his whole story since before he was even conceived and up until his death. In fact, beyond his death, because we have that very strange event in 2 Samuel where Saul, at the depths of despair, and before he, he ends up dying, goes to the witch of Endor, sometimes called the medium of Endor, and has the spirit of, of Samuel the prophet called up. And Samuel says, what are you bothering me for? You know, um, but so he has one appearance after his death. But Samuel is um, the first key player, Saul the second, David the third. In fact, if we wanted to have a very broad stroke description of uh, First Samuel, it would be broken down into Samuel the last judge, Saul the first king, and David the second king. We do not know who wrote First Samuel. The tradition is that the Jewish tradition, uh, not the Christian tradition. <laughs> is that it was written by Samuel. It almost is certain that Samuel, we're told in the first uh, book of 1 Samuel, that Samuel wrote things down. We're also introduced in 2 Samuel to two other people who we're told wrote of the histories. One is called Gad the seer, you know, he's a prophet. And the other is Nathan, who is the prophet who confronts, you know, comes into the picture after Samuel, and he's the one that confronts David after his sin with Bathsheba. Uh, so they're major people anointed by God. The likelihood that Samuel wrote this book, which originally, remember, was one book, is not, it's not likely because all of 2 Samuel happens after Samuel's death. Now again, God can, can anoint somebody with a miraculous understanding and they could, they could be able to predict those things, but it's not as likely. We do believe that a lot of the material, probably for Samuel, was written by Samuel and then taken up later by Gad or Nathan or others in order to create these books. We do, there is an indication that the books were written sometime between 930 and probably the early 700s. Remember, this is BC, so 700s is later than 900s. Um, the reason we say that is because there are references in here that indicate an awareness that the kingdom is going to be divided. And that happened, you know, but, but, so the timing would be sometime before um, the middle 700s, probably 770s or so, sometime between 930 and 770s based upon the internal content here. And again, when we say things like, the tradi Jewish tradition is that Samuel wrote this, that is, an, but that's probably not the case. I am in no way, it, the book does not say Samuel wrote this. See, that's the big issue. In the, in the letters of Paul and some of the Old Testament writings, um, it says this was written down by. Paul says, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So that if we say we don't believe that, that it's, that's really who wrote it, we basically are saying we don't believe what Scripture says. The Samuel, First and Second Samuel, nowhere does it say this book was written by Samuel. And that's why we say it technically is unknown. The tradition of the Jewish faith has been that Samuel wrote it. We believe at the very least that Samuel would have been responsible for writing parts of First Samuel and then God anointed other people later on to take that and add the other events to it. It in no way diminishes the divine inspiration of this book. Are we good there? You understand that? What I'm saying? Um, the theme, of course, is transition from theocracy under the judges to monarchy under the kings. That's what this book is about. It is the book where Israel changed their form of government. Theocracy, of course, means um, the rule by God. Theocracy is a, means a religious government. It literally means theos, you know, God, um, it, a God government. And interestingly enough, when the Israelites, we'll get into that when we go through the outline, when the Israelites say to Samuel, give us a king like everybody else who can fight our battles for us and lead us, and Samuel says, well, you don't need a king, what am I? I? I'm not a king, but you know, what's your problem? And Samuel goes to God and says, these people are telling me they want a king. Am I not good enough as, they're, as leading them as the last of the judges? And God said, Samuel, Samuel, calm down. Sam, Sam. Um, it's not you they're rejecting. It's me. God says, I have been their king, in effect. And so it's, it's not being willing to continue with me as their leader directly, through speaking through you, Samuel. But that, but that's what they're doing, is they're saying that we don't really trust that God is going to be with us and lead us and guide us. Um, we want a person to be king, not just prophet, but king. And so Samuel is offended personally about it, and God says, 
you don't have any reason to be offended. It's not you they have a problem with. It's me, God. So uh, it is the transition from theocracy, a religious um, political system where they looked directly to God rather than have an intermediary government, to a monarchy where they had the first three kings. Now, the united monarchy, which means the whole of the nation of Israel, all of the tribes together, only had three kings. The united monarchy only existed through Saul, David, and Solomon. And we'll talk about the split and some of, some of what that's all about next week when we talk about um, First and Second Kings, because that's the story of Solomon and what happens after Solomon's death and why it happens and the division of the kingdoms into two. All right? But during this time, Saul, David, and Solomon, the, all of the 12 tribes of Israel are united under one king. Right? Um, the purpose God uses his prophet Samuel to give the people the king that they want, Saul, at least the king they think they want, and then Saul's failures lead to David being made king. All right? We'll talk about that a little bit in the outline. You've all read this though, right? Like recently, not when you were in fourth grade. <laughs> all right. Probably uh, the key verse, I have two verses actually, that would be key verses for us to understand the book of Samuel. The first one is from 1 Samuel 8, verses 6 to 9. These were the people speaking to Samuel. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Even though Samuel wasn't the king, he was the one that they looked to for leadership. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what a king who will reign over them will claim as his right. And there's this long passage where Samuel turns around to the Israelites and says, Do you know what you're getting when you get a king? He will draft your young men and put them in his armies and make them chase, you know, run along after his uh, chariots. He'll take your young women and force them to serve in his palace. He will take your very best land, and, and even the land you're allowed to keep, he will take a huge share of what you produce on it for his own palace and his own use. And he goes on and on and on about all of the dangers of having a king as political leader. And the people say, no, no, we don't care, we don't care, we want a king. You know? So they got one. Um, second passage that I think is key to 1 Samuel is from 1 Samuel 15. But Samuel, and, and this is after, by the way, uh, Saul, Saul does a couple of things wrong. One of them is he's lined up getting ready to fight the Philistines, and Samuel is supposed to come and offer a sacrifice to the Lord before the battle in order to ask God's blessing on the troops as they fight against the Philistines. And Saul gets impatient. And Saul decides, I'm not going to wait any longer for Samuel. So he calls for the sacrificial animals, and he does the sacrifice himself, which is something he clearly was not supposed to do. That was not part of his job as king. That was the role of the priests and prophets. And in fact, it's interesting that when Saul first gets anointed, we're told that Samuel wrote down all of the responsibilities that he would have as king and made it all very clear. And then he says he put it before the Lord, which I think means probably that he, you know, he kind of uh, figuratively laid it before the Lord. But it may very well be that he took it and put it in the Ark of the Covenant, which was where, you know, that was the place of God. That was where God technically resided in their midst. And at that time, the Ark of the Covenant was kept in the tabernacle at Shiloh, which is up north of Jerusalem. But anyway. It had been made very clear to him what his responsibilities were. And he, he violated that by getting impatient and assuming for himself the rights and responsibilities that only the priest and prophet were supposed to have. And so, after sacrificing, as soon as he'd done that, Samuel arrives. And Samuel says, uh, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in, as in obeying the Lord? You disobey. That's a bigger deal than the fact that... that you, we hadn't had a sacrifice yet. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. 
I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Now, you might say, hey, he admitted he'd sinned. He repented. Isn't that, you know, okay? Doesn't that make it all all right? Well, it doesn't. And especially doesn't, because right before this, when Samuel walks up and says, what are you doing? Saul blames his, his, his troops. They made me do it. And then he does it again here. Okay, I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. There's no indication from the way the story is told that anybody but Saul decided to take this authority on himself. And yet he still blames somebody else. Okay, The one thing, that for, for the horrendous thing that David does later, where he sleeps with another man's wife and then arranges to have her husband killed so that he can marry Bathsheba, David never blames anybody else for it. You know, when he gets caught, when Nathan confronts him, David owns it. Yes, it is my sin. And that's something that we, the differences that we see when we look through through Scripture. And, and that's also a thing I think we can see historically. People, uh, even people, forget, not speaking about God for a minute, even people will forgive if somebody admits they did something wrong. When they try to cover it up, why do you think cover up has become one of the worst possible words in our language? If somebody tries to cover it up or make excuses for it, that's worse than what they did in the first place, right? Um, you know, I'm not trying to be political. I'm giving you two historical figures here. I'm not picking political sides. But, you know, Richard Nixon covered it up. What happened to him? You've got Ali North. Ali North in a congressional hearing, and I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of Ali North, but uh, just so you don't think I'm, I'm advocating anything here. Um, Ali North sitting before a congressional panel, and one of them says, is it true that while there were uh, congressional investigators in your outer office, you were in the inner office shredding documents? And he went, yes, did I get them all? <laughs> now, I'm not a big fan of that, but everybody forgave him. All right? No charges. Everybody let him off. If he had tried to cover it up, he would have probably gone the way of Richard Nixon. Now, that's just, that, that's the human side of it. But the same thing is true in terms of how God responds to us and how he responded to Saul versus how he responded to David. Now, David still had to sleep in the bed that he had made. There were still very strong consequences. But God says, I will not hold that sin against you in terms of, you know, he, he still loved him, he forgave him. But there were still consequences of it based upon how his family acted later. But in Saul's case, he kept trying to blame somebody else. And... For that, there was no forgiveness. A very important, I think, uh, lesson for us to learn in that. All right, let's look now. You'll stop me if you've got any questions or comments or anything, right? You know that. Um, and I, I have an absolute rule that I don't get political. So what I was just talking about was no way political. We don't, we don't get political conversations in the church, or we would be very quickly two or three or four or five churches. Um, so we don't do that. That's not why we're here. But... Uh, the book of 2 Samuel, again, originally part of the same book, the author is unknown, sometimes you will see anonymous. That's accurate if the book itself does not credit who wrote it, as this one does not. All right? Traditionally, by Jewish tradition of Samuel, same time period, because it was one book, uh, the theme here is the reign of King David and the growth of Israel under his leadership. At the very end of 1 Samuel, Saul dies. David um, is ready to take over. And then in 2 Samuel, he becomes first the king over uh, in Hebron over the Judah. In other words, the southern part of, of the country. And then later becomes, and, and Saul's son, Ishbosheth, is lifted up as being the king of the north. And then later is, he's assassinated and David becomes the king of the whole thing. But this is all about... The establishment of King David, the uh, reign of David, and the growth of Israel under his leadership. Now, the purpose is that the story of David, who's, one, who's the most popular king of all of them, one of the most important figures in Jewish history, again, I list him as one of the top three, the, you know, the father, Abraham, the lawgiver, Moses, and the great King David. Those are the three most important figures in the Old Testament. Um, the, the story of David, and this is important, People, people ask, well, how can you believe the Bible? Well, one of the reasons is because it, 
It's told with complete honesty, including successes, failures, faithfulness, sin, and repentance. Nobody can read this story and think somebody's trying to sell us a bill of goods. Because why in the world, if they were not trying to tell an accurate, true story, would they, would they tell us about the horrendous things that David did? Now, the same thing is true in the New Testament. We have New Testament figures, major figures. Peter, for instance, um, messing up and having to be corrected about it. Um, we have Paul, who prior to be, being converted was a horrendous character, dragging people off to be tortured and killed and, you know, all sorts of things. The Word of God, and this is a good example of it, the story of David, is completely forthright in all of the details, even if they don't make the main character look so good. That's really rare in world literature, uh, religious literature or anything else. Um, it, it was just common. It was expected that if you were writing a document that was in support of a particular thing, uh, a political belief, a religious belief, a, you know, the belief in, that the people of Israel had in this case, that you would gloss it over and make it sound as good as possible. This does not do that. Bob? Um, in our class, we were talking a little bit about some of the items of the Old Testament. And here we have King David, who's the big hero king of the Jewish people. And yet, as I understand it, there's practically no archaeological evidence uh, to prove the existence of King David. Seems a little puzzling to me why that is. Uh, well, we don't have archaeological evidence for most ancient figures. You know, we have, but some, like, the, at its height, the nation of Israel didn't didn't wasn't the equal of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians, or you know, any of the ancient empires that covered all of the Middle East, for instance. So they had more stuff to be dug up. Uh, we do actually have, there is evidence in Jerusalem of the city of David, which is the most important part of it, because when in 2 Samuel we have David conquering the city of the Jebusites and renaming it Jerusalem, and um, he describes how they did it through the water shaft, which we now know, it's, it's, you know, it's called uh, Hezekiah as well. We now know where that is, we know how he got into the city, there, are, there is very strong archaeological evidence in Jerusalem about the city of David being built uh, about 3,000 years ago, about 1,000 BC, um, and that was the citadel of David. We, we still have the citadel of David today, although that's been much, built much later, but there are archaeological ruins that demonstrate that, you know, there, so there is. Now, we don't have tablets that have the name of King David on it, you're right, um, but we have a lot of other evidence, archaeological evidence, that verify that the stories that are being told in the time of David and the events that occurred then uh, are true or legitimate. Becky? Well, I, I did read that, and I don't know what year it was, it's something two many years ago, that they found some type of half a tablet where a king was kind of bragging about his, his uh, where he conquered peoples, and he said, he said um, on there that he wiped out the house of David. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm not familiar with that. that was, yeah, that was one of the newest things that they found. And some, they dug it up out of some field. Yeah. It was an accident. Yeah. And they, they found that little piece. That piece, it's about... Okay. Good. Marvin? Can I back up to last week a little bit? When we sure. When seeing the tribe of Benjamin almost wiped out and uh, yeah. 600 and the horrific things. Some of the reading I did made a pretty strong case that that was probably over only 30 or 40 years after the death of Joshua. And the reasoning was all the weapons that they had and then 300 years later, why do you want a king? Well, the um, uh, Philistines. Philistines are persecuting them so badly they don't even have a blacksmith, they don't have any war weapons of war, and <laughs> holy God has not got them very far. Yeah. So uh, I think at that point they're pretty well willing to give up anything. Yeah, it's true. It was interesting, the first king was from the tribe of Benjamin. Yep. There had to be some kind of turnaround in that tribe over those a period of time that God would somehow, from that horrible, event, you know, find someone anything good in Benjamin. Well, and it may be that that's exactly why. Yeah. Because God, that was God's way of saying I'd accepted them back. When Saul, when uh, Samuel, through a series of conversations, he does do it all at once, when he, when he tells Saul that he is to be the new king of Israel, Saul's response, even though Saul, by all accounts, they say that Saul was as tall as everybody else from the neck down. Yeah. Meaning he was a head taller than everyone. Apparently quite handsome, he was very strong, you know, he presented just, he looked like a king, right? 
Um, so there are all sorts of reasons why you would look at him and say, yeah, he looks like a good candidate. But when Samuel came to him and said, you are to be the king over Israel, Saul's, resp Saul's response was, but why me? I am from the tribe of Benjamin, which is the smallest of all the tribes. And I am from the least of all the clans within the tribe of Benjamin. When he said that Benjamin was the least of all the clans, he probably meant that in two ways. It was not the most popular because of what they had done in the book of Judges and had almost been wiped out by the other tribes, but also because they had been almost wiped out. They probably didn't have nearly as much population at that point as some of the others did. And it may very well be that it was for exactly those reasons that God chose the king from Benjamin in order to be able to say, in effect, they are part of my people too. Don't, don't anybody make a mistake about that. Mike? Isn't there a tomb of David in, in uh, Jerusalem? Um, yeah, but I'm not sure if it's actually it's the tomb of David or not. There's also a tomb of Absalom that everybody knows has nothing to do with Absalom. It was built you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after that. So, um, but yeah, there is a tomb of David. Actually, I've been there now that you mention it. Now, it's the traditional tomb, but I don't know, I, I don't recall how much historical veracity they put in that. But I'm speaking out of ignorance here now, so maybe I need to do a little study on that. John? Uh, um, when this, this litany of warnings that Samuel gave to the people when they wanted a king right. really sets the backdrop for Messiah, mm -hmm. and for Christ to come. Because what he, what he says is, this man's going to come, you're going to put him as king, and he's going to concentrate on three things. Military strength, wealth, and aristocracy. He's going to have his own confectionaries there doing his bacon and yeah. all of this stuff. And he will live <coughs> as a leech. And the, the, the image that he portrayed through this earthly king, which has continued through history even to the present day, mm -hmm. is a real contrast to the Messiah who came as king of kings and lord of lords and gave right. his life on the cross. Yeah. That's, just That's true, although both Samuel and David are seen as archetypes that, that are predictive of the coming Messiah. Um, you know, Samuel, just in terms of his character, of his obedience to God, of his speaking the word of God, of his leading the people and all that. David, born in Bethlehem, you know, um, with, with some major, fairly major but limited exceptions, a righteous man, a man after God's own heart, and remember that the promise was that there would always be an heir of David on the king, on the throne uh, of Judah. Now, and you go, well, but there's no king of David. Well, there's no, there's no king anymore. Once a kingship is reestablished, the promise is that that king will be of the line of David, and of the line of David is Jesus. Now, Jesus is a direct descendant, through Mary, in terms of biologically, and also through Joseph in terms of legally, because as a stepfather, the legal inheritance came through Joseph. In both lines, they both lead back to David. That's why during the census in the, in the Christmas story, that a census was being held, and everybody had to go back to their hometown, which means the original sort of seat of their tribal uh, family. And Joseph and Mary, his... his you know, uh, wife went to Bethlehem because both of them were of the line and tribe of David, and that was the center of the tribe of David. Okay, we had somebody else over here for a second. Yeah. Um, I just found it amazing that when Samuel goes to make Saul king, they can't even find him. Because oh yeah, he's hiding. he's hiding. I mean, what kind of person would you, you know, he's hiding in bags or trash? In or the baggage, yeah, back in the baggage lot, yeah. Dear Lord, you know, you have to think, what, what, what are well, but again, you look at him and you look like, wow, you know, apparently. Um, and the other thing that people don't often notice is that after they crown him king, and what they do is they, you know, God, God declares that he is to be king, and Samuel anoints him. Then they call all the people together at Meribah, and they go through a, a, a process of drawing lots, which is supposed to be completely by chance, to select a king. Well, God's hand was on that, and as they chose lots, they chose the tribe of Benjamin, and then they tro chose, you know, the clan, and then on the family, and then the final lot that was drawn was Saul. And they're looking around, where is he? 
Where is Saul? And they had to go looking for him because he was hiding. Because remember, Samuel had already told him, you're going to become king. And he knew it was coming. So he was hiding out. But the, the interesting part of that is, after they draw lots, after they announce him as king, and they proclaim him king, and God has said you're king, and everything else, what does Saul do? Do you remember? He goes back out in the field and working with the oxen. And then later, when, he, when they find out that the Philistines have, you know, have taken over one of the towns, one of his first military thing, he's coming back from the field with the oxen when they tell him this, and he gets angry. Apparently it's a righteous anger. And he butchers the oxen and has pieces of them sent all over to the 12 tribes saying, anyone who does not respond, any men who do not respond in order to fight against the Philistines here, their, their oxen are going to be treated like this. In other words, you're, you're going to lose everything you've got, is the message. Uh, but he'd gone back to the fields. He was going back to be a farmer. All right? And it wasn't until after his first military victory that he began to assume what we think of as being a kingship kind of role. Yes, ma'am. What is this thing about slaughtering somebody <laughs> and, and sending it out to the 12 tribes, including the woman? Exactly, the concubine yeah, and, and I mean, judges. Yeah, now he's doing what, what is the idea of getting a hunk of meat? Well, like um, you, you saw The Godfather, right? Yeah. <laughs> you oh, know the early scene where the, where the wealthy movie producer you know, wakes up and he's going, and he pulls back and there's this, the racehorse's head that he yeah. owns. Why? What? What? What was the point of that? Well, the idea you get a bloody piece of meat, and there's a whole lot of connotations behind that. The idea, not only that it was very, very, very expensive, and that he loved the racehorse, all that's true, but the fact that there was a severed head of a racehorse in his bed conveyed a very serious message that the next, the next step could be some other kind of bloody meat. Yeah. Okay, You better pay attention to this, and you better tell the line. Well, that's what both of those case stories, one in, one in Judges and this one in Samuel, says. He, they, send, they butcher the oxen and send it out and say, you know, in this case, Saul said, whoever does not respond to this call to come and fight this battle, your oxen are going to be treated the same way. In other words, you're going to personally pay the consequences for this. And so, in effect, it was the same message as putting the dead, that racehorse's head in the bed. And that is, nothing, nothing like a bloody piece of butchered meat to convince you that they mean business. Okay? And so that's what that was all about. And in both cases, it was used to call forth, you know, response from, from uh, the military response. Yes? <clears throat> you were talking about the cardinals. Uh, the kings that were off the rule would have to be the descendants of David, the, the lineage of David. After David, yes. After David. But the thing that's interesting is that the Romans burned down the temple, destroyed the temple in 70 AD, and they destroyed the genealogical record. So only Jesus would be able to come back and, 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 and claim the lineage. He's the only one we know that far back. Yep. And that's true. In fact, most Jewish people today don't know what tribe they're descended from. Some do. For instance, um, if you've ever known anyone who, with the last name Cohen, he's a Levite. Okay, because that was the name of somebody from the tribe of Levi. And so there are some linkages that, that we have that have been passed down because of names. Uh, but for the most, a lot of Jewish people do not know what tribe they came from because all the genealogical records and everything they could have traced uh, was destroyed and then the people were, were scattered. Yes, Ron? My uh, fellow student mentioned it's like the cartels. They're doing things like Yeah, they do bloody things in order to convey yeah. a message that's true. Yeah, yeah. Like they statement. So, Book of Second Samuel is about David. You know, David has has First Samuel is is about Samuel and Saul and the introduction of David. Second Samuel is about the reign of David. It starts with the triumphs of David, the first ten chapters. You know, from one success at to another, all of them ones that he gets credit to God for, and then the transgression of David in chapter eleven, where he sees a beautiful woman bathing on a rooftop. You know, somebody else's mirror door. And being the king, he makes arrangements to have an illicit rendezvous with her. She gets pregnant. He arranges to have her husband, Uriah the Hittite, killed. Um, and Uriah the Hittite is, is an honorable man. You know, the, the, this powerful story that David calls him back from the army on the pretense of giving him a report, thinking, okay, he's coming back. He'll go and sleep with his wife, and they'll think that baby is his. Nobody will suspect. But Uriah says, you know, David says, aren't you going home to your wife? 
and he goes, no, my commander and my fellow army uh, comrades are sleeping out in fields and um, you know, at the scene of battle, it would not be appropriate for me to take advantage of this situation and go home to my you know, comfortable house and sleep with my wife because of solidarity with his colleagues that are out in the field you know, fighting this battle. And then the next night, David tries to get him drunk, thinking I'll get him drunk and then he won't have the, nearly the qualms and he'll go home and they'll think that the baby is his. And he still doesn't do it. He still sleeps out on the, the steps of David's palace with David's servants, um, and so he ends up killing, having him killed. Um, so, this I think is a key verse for us in understanding 2 Samuel from the 7th chapter. Um, this is the promise to David. In fact, the verse right before this says, I brought you out of, you know, you were a shepherd in the fields, and I brought you out of the fields and brought you to this place. This is Nathan speaking to David the words that God has given him, the prophet Nathan. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. A house means a, a line of descendants. You know, the house of David doesn't mean a building. It means all of those who, who were his descendants, his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, on down. The Lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. This is going to be Solomon. He is the one who will build a house for my name. This is the temple that Solomon built. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, I believe what, what he's meaning when he says that when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod and wielded by men, that Solomon is forced to accept the natural consequences of his failings, his own sin, which ends up being allowing the worship of other gods, even encouraging by building altars, because he had all of these wives that wanted to worship their, their original gods. But instead of God directly taking action against Solomon, removing him as he did with Saul, Instead, what happens is the consequence of Solomon's sin is the natural results that would occur. In that case, because of Solomon being the way Solomon was, the nation was split after him, after his death, so that his son ruled um, part of it and a rebel ruled part of it. And it was a natural consequence of the fact that Solomon was not regarded in the way that uh, at the end of his life as he had been earlier. So God didn't go in and go, all right, you're out of here. I'm putting, I've already picked somebody else. They're going to be in place. God allowed the natural sequence of events to happen so that the results of Solomon's sin were that Solomon's son did not inherit the entire entire nation. Okay, um, God dealt with it a very different way than he did with Solomon. That's, that's the point that's being made there. Okay? Any questions about any of that? Yes, go ahead. Well, it's going back a little bit, but why didn't the law of adultery apply to uh, Bathsheba and... It did. How? She wasn't That's... stoned. He wasn't stoned. Right. Uh, when you mean the punishment that was called for. Well, I don't think, um, I don't think anybody accused them of that other than Nathan. Um, I don't know if it's because they actually didn't know, or because since he was the king, God's own righteous king, people would not accuse him of crime. And if that sounds strange to you, um, right now, in the last 30 years, we've had presidents that claim executive privileges that prevent them from being charged with crimes. So if it's true of the president, then it's true of the king. You know, that's the claim that's often been made, is executive privilege. Where, where's the lie? I mean, how bad does it have to get before they can no longer claim executive privilege and do not, you know, are not... Um, kept from any prosecution of any kind. Well, in the old days, that same kind of principle held with kings, except more so. You know, a king was held, especially these kings, who were held to be God's own hand-picked servants, um, they were pretty much above the law. And so, that's probably what we're dealing with there. I was thinking of diplomatic immunity. In the US. Yeah, except that's from somebody from another country. You know, yes. He's in his own country, but true. it's true. That is true. John? Just an observation. Um, this this promise 
uh, seemed unconditional. Yet in in uh, First Kings later, uh, the Lord appears to Solomon and gives him that same promise, but it becomes conditional. Yeah. Now, if you will walk in your integrity, if you do not, I'll take this away from you, and yeah. I will destroy all this. Yeah. So, it's. Uh, well, and I think that I think those two things are not contradictory because when it says when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod and wielded by men. Well, God will still God still allowed those things to happen. God did not miraculously in any way intervene, and so the result of Solomon's failings is that Solomon's descendants did not inherit. That's just an explanation for why, right. you know, when it came to that, it was separated in the kingdom. Yep. Right. I, I want to skip over something here real quick, and there's a bunch of pieces of its chronology, but I want to show you this. Um, the combined nation of Israel, the monarchy, this green area is what the nation of Israel, the United Nation of Israel was under Saul. This is the Dead Sea or Salt Sea. This is the Sea of Galilee, Jerusalem right there at the star. So this is what Saul controlled. David took over, and a big chunk of 2 Samuel is, the, is David's military uh, campaigns because he took seriously the fact God said, I want you to, you know, I want the whole of the promised land to be yours, and so you have to do your share to take it. The purple part here is what David controlled during his life, and most of that he took control of very early on. Now you'll notice you still had the Edomites, you still had some Moabites. Some Ammonites, those were all people that David ended up um, having a problem with and then later conquering. Actually, his campaigns included victories over the Edomites, Moabites, and Ammonites. You still have the Philistines right here, this yellow strip. David also defeated the Philistines. And then the Phoenicians up here. The Phoenicians are, that's actually a misnomer. There's not one nation called the Philistines. The cities of Philistine, Tyre, Sidon, and Biblos, Biblos especially, were city-states. The only reason they're called the Philistines is because um, you know they all had come from a similar place, and that, that lets you talk about that whole area at one time that was not conquered by Israel. All right? Is, is, no? excuse me, is Phoenicia like a geographical name for the dwelling place of the Philistines? Well, the the no uh, the Philistines. The Philistia is here. Okay. Phoenicia is up here. So they That's two different things. Okay, the Phoenicians, and again, the Phoenicians were not a nation like the Philistines, Edomites, Moabites, etc. They didn't have one king. Every one of their cities had a king and was independent. But people referred to them as the Phoenicians because they were from common ancestors, and they, you know, they were all independent. And so that was just that area over there belongs to those guys, and they call them the Phoenicians for shorthand. But the Philistines are here now. The name Palestine comes from Philistines. Right? Because that was the people that were, you know, that traveled. That, that everybody along the coast here, the Philistines and the Phoenicians, both were known for travel. They were mariners. And this whole area became known as Palestine, which is a, you know, a boiling down of the <coughs> Philistine. Um, so, but you get an idea. And then the dark purple part was David's kingdom. Then you get areas, this, this sort of pink area is an area that Solomon gained economic control of. That, does, that means it was not technically part of his kingdom, but they were paying, uh, you know, paying royalties to him. They were, they were, he was getting financial benefit. In that way, not, not fully, but in that way at least, the Israelites actually did reach the Euphrates River in terms of this being you know, the promised land. But again, that Zobah up here, while the king of Zobah had been conquered, uh, they were, it didn't come under administrative control. It was not actually part of the kingdom. They simply were, were, were not fighting against him anymore, and they agreed to pay, um, you know, pay duties to the king. Okay? So I wanted you to see that so you get some idea of what we're talking about. And of course, down here, you've got the, the Gulf of Aqaba, the Sinai Peninsula. Over here would be uh, Egypt. Up here is uh, Asia Minor, what we know of as Turkey, etc. All right. Questions about that, Marvin? Uh, Moab and the other two countries down there, they were also conquered basically, but they, they were. were kept to draw water and cut wood and exactly. Those tasks. They were made laborers. Now the reason I think that they're, they're like this is because you know the problem with the map is that unless you have a have a yeah. some sort of very fancy thing going on, um, you, you can't. It's static. 
Yeah. And the reason why these are colored differently and they're included inside David's is that for a long period of time they were independent and then David conquered them and they were under his control, but they did still maintain some, in, some independence, but as servants. They were, they were laborers to the nation of Israel, but they still did maintain some sense of identity. They were not completely destroyed, okay, as the Amalekites and, were supposed to have been and others. Okay, um, I've got about seven minutes till. Let's take a break until five minutes after two, and then we will get into both the chronology and also the detail of the outline of these two books. And what they okay, I want to do something right now that's a little different. Um, I think all of us, us being Christians, church people, people who take the Bible seriously, we should have at least um, an abbreviated, a simplified version of the history of God's working in the world. And so, in other words, to be able to tell what is the story of the Israelites and how does that lead up to Jesus, etc. And so leading up to what we're going to talk about today, I want to give you one. I want to spend just a few minutes and give you the whole scope of what God's work has been. Right? The first 11 chapters of Genesis are the, the, the prehistoric period, if you will, meaning before history was written. The four great events that are in that, starting with the creation, the fall, you know, the Tower of Babel, um, and what's the fourth one? Somebody else? Uh, the flood. The flood. Just right out of my head. Then Abraham is called in the 12th chapter. Abraham is to be the father of the Hebrew people. He is promised that if he will be obedient to God and follow him, that he will be the father of a great people. He will be given a land. That they will have as a homeland, a promised land, and that he will be the blessing for all the peoples of the earth. That was then renewed to his son Isaac and renewed to Isaac's sons Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One of those sons, Joseph, got sold by his brothers into slavery and taken into Egypt. And in Egypt, with God's blessing, he came to be the second most powerful person in Egypt when it was the most powerful country in the world. During a time of famine, Jacob and his other 11 sons and their families went down to Egypt to buy grain, or actually he sent them down to buy grain. They ended up finding out Joseph was there, going down and spending time in Egypt. Some many, many, many years later, Scripture says there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph, you know, a new guy who didn't remember that Joseph had been so important because he's long dead. And because the Israelites are foreigners, he imprisons them, in, or puts them into slavery, doesn't imprison them, he turns them into slaves. They were oppressed. God raises up Moses. Moses is there for a while. He's gone for a while. He comes back. Uh, Moses leads the people out of slavery in Egypt, miraculously crossing the Red Sea. At Mount Sinai, he has given the law, the covenant of law. And then God is prepared to fulfill his promise to the Israelites and give them a home of their own where they can live and live in peace, he says. But... The people, when after they send spies in, they don't believe that God that they can really do it. They don't trust that God will enable them to fight against the people who already live in Canaan. And so all except Joshua and Caleb say, no, we can't do this. Joshua and Caleb said we could. Because of that lack of faith, God has them wander in the desert for 40 years until all of the adult males have died except Joshua and Caleb. And then he brings them up. Moses dies just before they cross the Jordan River into the Holy Land. Joshua is leading them. They come into the Holy Land. Joshua leads the conquest of the Holy Land, which a, a great part of it is completed, but not all of it. When Joshua reaches the end of his life, he gives them instructions to continue to, to conquer the land. Joshua dies, and then they all, you know, put their feet up and crack open a beer and decide they're not going to do anything else. And so they end up being oppressed by the various of the Canaanite tribes that still exist. The mold, you know, the, within the land of Canaan, they're having troubles all over the place. This is the story of the judges. And in order to keep them from being completely um, destroyed, they would be under oppression from the Philistines, for instance, in Samson's day. For, uh, there are 12 judges, six major and six minor judges, as you learned recently. Um, but whenever it got so bad that they would call out to God, God would send a judge to be a leader and a military um, strategist, and the person that would take care of them, and everything would be fine until that person died, then they go back to their old ways again and they have another problem. Then Samuel is raised up as the last of the judges, the first of the great prophets, and that's where we pick up in the book of Samuel. 
Samuel's not listed in Judges because the focus of his efforts are in Samuel, but he is the last of the Judges, and he is described as that. In fact, the book of Acts calls Samuel the last of the Judges and the first of the prophets, okay. not, not counting Moses, who was a prophet as well. Were the Judges uh, prophets? Uh, well, not in the, it, the... Some of them were given the gift of prophecy, but not prophets in the same way. They, they were... They were sort of isolated in terms of their areas of responsibility, whereas Samuel was responsible for the whole of the people. The prophets usually would be given an assignment to the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, whatever. But to whatever body of people they were called, they were God's universal voice there. The, the judges were much more isolated than that in terms of dealing with, with very specific kinds of areas and situations and, and enemies. Okay? So that brings us up to here where we have the start of the monarchy. Saul, we just talked about, David, and Solomon. After Solomon, the nation is split in two. Because of Solomon's sin, his son is not able to take control of the whole thing. Now, after that, in fact, part of a fulfillment of the promise to David that your, you know, your house will sit on the throne, the northern kingdom of Israel, which was uh, run, they split off from Solomon's heir, and they ran their own thing. They had nine different dynasties, nine different families who put forth kings to rule the northern kingdom of Israel before it got destroyed by the Assyrians. In the southern kingdom, all of them were descendants of David up until the time that they were destroyed by the Babylonians. So in that regard, unlike the northern kingdom, which had all these different families that, that, that would assassinate each other, I mean, it's like I, Claudius. Uh, in the south, they had their problems, and not all of the rulers were good, but... Uh, descendant of David was a ruler in Jerusalem until the destruction by the Babylonians in 586. Okay. So, um, we then have the diaspora when they're taken off into Babylon, where they're carried off into captivity. Then under Ezra and Nehemiah, and we're going to go over a lot of this, they come back to rebuild the temple and rebuild the walls of the city. And that continues. Uh, the last of the prophets is Malachi in the 400s. And then we come forward, there's this long period of silence when there was not a prophetic voice in Israel, and we come to the time of Jesus, right? And for the rest of it, you'll have to take the New Testament classes. But I think, I wanted to give that to you because we're, we're right in the middle of part of that, and I think all of us need to have a sense, what were the big periods? You know, what, what are the major movements that are in our Bible? I mean, if somebody were to sit you down and say, tell me what the Bible says, can you do it? Can you give them that kind of story that I just gave you in five minutes or less? Mm -hmm. Yes, Ken. What you're saying is so important, too, because I, in a strange situation, I ended up with a guy at work that totally made fun of the scriptures, the Bible, and we ended up with about a two-hour session with nothing to do, and for that two hours, I went from the beginning of the Bible to the end. And when he was, when I was done, he was so excited that he wanted to learn more about God. I brought him the Bible. We didn't work together after that. But exactly what you're talking about, it, it, it's just so important to be able to do that. Right. We need to be able to tell the story, and the story includes the Old Testament, Mark. Okay. And so I want to recommend to you that you. Think about that, and you know what I've just given to you. If you need to go back and review the tape, it's on there. But you need to be able to talk about the large, the large chunks. Not even if you can't get into a lot of the fine details, the large chunks of the salvation history, and that's really what it is. A little German for you, Bob. Heilsgeschichte, the salvation history. Okay, since the very start of God from the creation on, and. and articulated in specific words from Abraham on, from the 12th chapter of Genesis on, has been God's promise that he would be God to a chosen group of people and he would bless them and guide them when they did wrong, they would be punished for it, he would never renounce his covenant commitment and agreement with those people. And that carries into the New Testament. Everything in the New Testament, Jesus and the whole rest of it, is a fulfillment of the original covenant promise God had made. Well, we can't really understand that unless we know the Old Testament story. So I did all that for you because as I was going through this chronology, preparing it, I thought, you know, we need to know what the major things are. And I, I actually have, have recommended to people, I did it on the talks I did on the Windstar Cruise. Uh, I said, it's great if you have a couple, just a couple of dates. Nobody, you know, people complain about learning a lot of dates. Well, 
win. You can learn a lot more about this than you, you, than you think. Think in terms of around 1500 and a little later, Moses. Around 1000 and a little later, we get David. Around 600 or so is the end of the nation of Israel with the final destruction by, uh, by the Babylonians. And then you get to, the, you know, five, six hundred years after that, you get Jesus. If you remember just a few dates, you can hang a lot of detail on those things. Anyway, I'm, I'm actually suggesting that you learn this stuff. Radical idea that it is. Okay. All right. A chronology of First and Second Samuel. I'm going to give you some dates here, much more specifically, but you'll get the idea. Uh, the birth of Samuel, we believe, this is approximate. So I could put circa or C on that, which means as best we know. You know, approximately, about. The birth of Samuel, about 1105 B.C., and where we have appropriate scripture passages to look at. 1 Samuel 1.20, um, you can refer to. About 1080 is the birth of Saul. Again, Samuel's birth, we have all the details on. Saul, we just have to pick a base a date on, you know, how old approximately he was when he was made king, etc. So about 1080, the birth of Saul. Then, about 1050, Saul is anointed to be king by Samuel. Again, that's in 1 Samuel. About 1040, we have the birth of David. So, Saul was about 40 years old when David was born. Um, David was actually pulled out of obscurity uh, uh, at about age 15. <laughs> um, and so, that means that Saul was probably 55 when David came onto the picture in terms of being uh, drafted to be first a musician and then by his own volunteering, a warrior uh, for Saul. 1025 is when David is anointed to be Saul's successor. 1010, we have the death of Saul and the beginning of David's reign over Judah in Hebron. At first, David was only made king over the tribe of Judah. Judah was the largest of all the tribes. It controlled almost the whole southern part of the country, the area around Jerusalem particularly. So, and the capital of Jerusalem didn't exist yet. David later captures that from the Jebusites. But the center of control of the tribe of Judah was in Hebron. He was, you know, God told him. He asked God, where should I go? And he said, go to Hebron. And so he first became ruler over all of the Judah. And then seven years later, he takes over all of Israel. North, south, all of the tribes that existed. Marvin? Uh, Jonathan? Uh how much older did David you think he was? Um, not too much older. I, I, I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have yeah, to maybe do some research battles. on that. Well, he, when he ate the honey, he was already fighting battles with Saul, and David was still a... I don't know if he'd been anointed yet or where he was. Yeah, I was a little way equal, equal in age, but now I'm starting to think that uh, Jonathan was 10 or 15 years older. Well, Jonathan might have been, I would imagine Jonathan was somewhat older, but not a lot older. Because yeah. people remember when, you know, David is, is 16 or 17 when he kills Goliath. Yeah. And he starts he starts <laughs> the battle then. If that sounds astonishing to you, we draft people at 18, you know, it's not that much difference. Uh, and um, I think by the time that we really get a picture of Jonathan fighting battles, like when he and his shield bearer, you know, killed 20, 20 Philistines in a half an acre, Kind of thing. Uh, I believe that's David is already working for Saul as a musician because that happens fairly early on. Although he has not yet demonstrated his own military ability, so uh, it could be it could have been that Jonathan was twenty and David was sixteen or seventeen. You know, around that time. Okay, so there's not a huge difference. I don't know that for a fact though. There could have been another five years difference or something else, but they were close enough to be very very close friends. Okay. Um, then we have the period from 997 to 992, about a six-year period of David's wars. That's where he went from that little green thing I showed you that was um, the, the kingdom of Saul to that much larger purple area. And God gave him instructions. And in fact, in your book, those of you who have the book, there's a, there's a uh, map that has lines that show David's various campaigns out from the same central place to do battle against the Philistines and the, the uh, Ammonites and the Arameans and the Moabites and the Edomites and the Ammonites and all the Ites that were around them. Um, so those were David's wars. Then 991, we have the birth of Solomon. I've only hit the high points here. Obviously, it's not going to be exhaustive. 
980, which is toward the end of 2 Samuel, we have David's census. And we'll talk in a few minutes about why that was a problem. Um, and then the end of David's reign in 970 is recorded both in 2 Samuel and in 1 Kings. Because there's a little bit of overlap there. Um, the end of David's time and the ascension of Solomon to the throne. So those are kind of the high points. Was the question? Okay. Yeah, you scratch your ear, I'll call it. Uh, Yes. How did David come up with the name of Jerusalem, and what does the name mean? Uh, it does not mean what a lot of people think. It does not mean Shalom. There's no reference to Shalom. People think it's Jerusalem. It's not. Um, it's actually based on Salem, um, in, in terms of, you know, Salem, Massachusetts kind of thing. It's the same root. Uh, Jahu means victor over or victor of. So I have to look. I don't, I'm not, it's not coming to my mind right now. Does somebody else know? The meaning of Jerusalem. I know it's not the Shalom thing, which everybody says, oh, it's the city of peace. That's not what it means. But he changed the name to Jerusalem. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was the city of uh, uh, the Jebusites, is what it's just referred to as that. He named it Jerusalem. So, okay? So again, now that you've got all of that, this is the map again. The green part, Saul's kingdom. The purple part, what was the kingdom uh, at the height of David's time, and then Saul didn't actually add any part of the kingdom, but he added uh, economic control up here in Zobah, the region in the north. All right. Any questions about any of that? And I want to I one spend some question. You know, looking at the map with the very narrow uh, arm in Phoenicia and also down in Palestine, uh, and those were separate kings. I'm surprised that. Uh, Israelites didn't just come over and take that territory. Was there something that, something from stopping them from doing? Well, the Philistines were tough locked. I mean, I mean, they, they appear more than back in Samson's day. They were supposed to have been driven out, but they were a huge problem in Samson's day. And they are the primary enemy, the one that keeps coming back through all of First and Second Samuel, through all of David, both Saul. I mean, the, the Philistines are the ones that led to Saul's death. It was a battle against the Philistines that he was about to be taken and he get wounded and he ends up killing himself. Um, and then they ended up, David finally suppressed them. But he, he didn't drive them completely out. He didn't, he didn't kill them all. And so again, while he controlled the Philistines, they still maintain. Now you'll notice these two areas, cities, Gaza, Ashdod, Joppa. There were other Philistine cities that were over here. Gath and Eklon and others that were completely taken over. But when you see something like this or like this, it's not so much that they controlled all that land, but those were cities that were controlled by either kings or lords. In Philistine, they had five lords of the five major cities. And so they were maintaining control of those cities and were not completely driven out of those cities. But the Israelites were doing the very best they could all through here in, in the battle against the Philistines because they didn't want to stay there. They kept coming over. In fact, one of the major battles that they had against the Philistines is up here. You know, it's up in Syria. Uh, so the Philistines were marauding. They were going out from there. They weren't just staying home and, and being a bother. Um, and then the Phoenicians, as I say, it's only, they're only cities. They're kings of cities. It's not really a country. And so those cities were very, very powerful. In fact, Tyre had never been conquered until Alexander the Great. And you all know that story. Yeah. Alexander the Great came, comes along, and Tyre was in two parts, part of it on an island, part of it on the shore. The island part was over half a mile away, so he tears down the old the city that's on the shore of Tyre and builds a causeway all the way out to the other city in order to conquer it. And they're all sitting out there doing this sort of Monty Python thing, you can't get us, kind of stuff, probably with a French accent, I don't know. And, and Alexander showed them, but no one else had prior to that had ever been able to conquer the city of Tyre. You know, that's why they thought they were so safe. Yes, Ron? And, and it's still today, there's no the Philistines, Palestine, they're still, they're, they're not over there. Well, Palestine is the whole thing now. It's not just that anymore. I mean, the name comes from that, but there's not a direct link between Palestinians and the, and the, and the Philistines. Okay, it's just the name. Yes. The Palestinian name comes from the Romans who wanted to wipe out all traces of the Jews being in that area after the revolts that they had. And so they, they stuck it on there as an insult to the Jews as much as anything else. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, let's look at an outline of First and Second Samuel. And we're just going to talk through the stories again because... Um, I, 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 yes, Bob? According to the internet that knows everything, uh, 
Jerusalem is for two Semitic words, meaning a load of peace. That's wrong. It, it, shalom is not part of that. And that's a common misconception, but shalom is not part of that. And I, I actually have done some study on that, and that's why I'm sit, standing up here just appalled, but I can't remember what it actually does mean, but I clearly remember it said it is not shalom. Shalom in Hebrew is, is shalom. Jerusalem is Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim, yeah, is the... But, I don't know. But I know it says that, and I know people believe that, but that part's not true. Um, but I don't know either. So I'll find out. Um, so, First and Second Samuel. As I said, the birth of Samuel, Samuel is such an important figure, that we have all the details prior to his birth and his birth. Uh, Hannah, his mother, was one of two wives uh, to Elkanah, and the other wife is having babies, and she's making fun of Hannah because she's not able to have babies, and we have to understand there that having children was considered a direct blessing of God. Not having children was an indication that in that day that you were not favored by God, that there was something wrong with you, and that God didn't love, perhaps God didn't love you at all. Well, um, Hannah goes up to the temple in Jerusalem. She prays. They're from Ramah, which is an area just not too far north of Jerusalem. She prays for a child, and when she's there praying, she's praying so fervently with her eyes closed and her lips are moving that Eli, the priest, thinks that she's drunk. And he said, woman, stop drinking. You know, you're drinking too much. He goes, I'm not drunk. I'm just praying. And he tells her what he's praying for, and she says, well, I, I, my prayer for you is that God gives you what you want. And sure enough, she gets pregnant. She has a son, and in gratitude to that son being born, when, they, when everybody was convinced it was too late, she was not going to have any children, um, she dedicates him to the Lord. And so after he is weaned, in other words, after he's eating solid food, she takes him to Jerusalem and presents him to this priest, Eli, and says, this is my son. I want to present him to the Lord to, to be of service to the Lord. And, you know, we'll come back and visit. And they did. <laughs> Every year she would bring him a new robe and various other things. So they did have some contact. But he stayed in the temple um, serving Eli the priest and serving the needs of the temple as a young man. And if you go on the web and you look up the prophet Samuel, they have images of a number of different paintings of Eli as a child, of a Samuel as a child, talking to Eli or responding. Because in the middle of the night, we get down to... The third section here, uh, Samuel's initiation and recognition of God's prophets. Uh, God's pro as God's prophet, he goes to sleep one night, he sleeps in the temple, and he hears someone call his name, and he jumps up and he runs into Eli and says, what can I do for you, master? Eli said, I didn't call you. He goes back and lies down, he hears it again, he runs in, what, what do you need? I didn't call you. And the third time, when he hears it, he runs in, Eli says, the next time you hear that, say... Here I am, Lord, I'm listening, you know, what is it you desire? Because Eli recognized it was God speaking to Samuel. And he finally, when Samuel does that, God speaks to him and says, I am going to do away with the house of Eli, and you will be my prophet. Well, the reason was that while Eli was doing everything he could as a, as a the priest, his two sons, who also had become priests after him, because this is a familial thing, they were horrible. They were... Women would come up to the temple and they would take advantage of them and sleep with them. They were taking bribes and money. They were, uh, you know, instead of waiting and taking a fair share of the sacrificial food because the, the priests were allowed to take a certain amount of the meat that was to be sacrificed, they would take, take it before it was even sacrificed, you know. And so they were terrible. And Eli spoke to them and said, stop being like that. And they said, yeah, what are you going to do about it? And so Eli was actually, you know, God judged Eli for not taking action against his sons who were the priests. So that was held against Eli. Um, then we come to a time where Israel, without faithful leadership, in the fourth chapter, Israel goes out to fight against the Philistines. They don't have a king. They don't have a major leader. They go out to fight against the Philistines. The Philistines whip up on them really good. So the Israelites say, okay, what we need to do is, is send to Hebron and get the Ark of the Covenant Bring it back, and if we have the Ark of the Covenant with us, then we will win the battles, which had been true with Joshua. So they bring the Ark of the Covenant, but they don't have any faith. It's almost like they think it's going to be magic. Well, they not only get defeated, but the Ark of the Covenant gets taken by the Philistines, and the Philistines kill both of Eli's sons. Eli, who's an old man, is sitting in a chair back home, 
know, sitting waiting outside waiting for word. They come up to him and, and he says, how goes the battle? And he says, the Israelites are defeated, the Philistines won, they, they, took, they stole the Ark of the Covenant, and your two sons are dead. Other than that, how was it? <laughs> Eli, in his shock, he falls over backwards in his chair, breaks his neck, and dies. So the whole line of the chief priest's family, which are supposed to be the religious leaders, but were not worthy of it, the way they acted, are now gone. And the Ark of the Covenant is gone. This is a really dark day, all right? But God isn't finished yet. You all remember in the, um, the Raiders of the Lost Ark at the very end, the Ark of the Covenant has been put in this big box, and they carry it into some secret warehouse, where we don't know, Area 52 or something. They take it in, and they set it down, and they set it down right next to this, this box that has a, a swastika on it, which was artifacts they had captured from the Nazis. Well, the Ark of the Covenant is there, and all of a sudden, the swastika starts getting black. And the swastika, the symbol of the Nazis, is completely burned out while you're watching. Okay? I mention that because that's sort of what happens with the Ark of the Covenant. The Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant, and they have it, and they take it to one of the cities, and they think, well, this is going to be great. We put it in the temple of Dagon, which was their god. Now, the Philistines had come from elsewhere in the Mediterranean, including uh, from Crete. So they may have been related to the Minoan civilization, which is the oldest European civilization. They had come there. Um, and Dagon, however, was a Canaanite god that they had adopted. Fertility god, child sacrifice, the whole thing. So he's a horrible god. Well, they put the Ark of the Covenant in Dagon's temple. And the next morning, everybody comes to the temple, and the image of Dagon has fallen on its face. It's fallen over. And they go, well, that's not good. So they set Dagon back up. They go away. The next day they come back. Not only has Dagon fallen over, but his head is gone, and his, his hands are across the threshold. I guess like trying to crawl away. Um, so they say, well, we've got to get the Ark of the Covenant out of here. And they say in here, I don't know if you remember, that because of that, of finding parts of the, of the, the god, the idol of Dagon on the threshold, that the priest would not step on the threshold after that when they crossed into the temple. That's, as far as I can tell, and I've looked at it a little bit, that's the source of the idea that you don't step on the threshold. It's bad luck to step on a threshold when you enter a building. Some people believe that. Okay. So anyway, so they take it out of Dagon's temple, and all the people start getting tumors. They start getting, they get cancer, basically. And so they take it from one location to another location, and the people in that location, after it arrives, they go, you sent it here to try to kill us, even though these are all Philistines in Gath. And so the people of Gath don't want it there, and they, they send it off. And so they all have to get together. All the five cities of Philistine have to get together, and they say, what are we going to do with this? And they all agree, let's send it back to the Israelites, but we better send something along. And so, weird. Yes. They say... <laughs> as a tribute to the God of the Israelites, and so that, you know, he'll leave us alone, let's send five gold tumors and five golden rats. The tumors representing the cities of Philistine that were affected, or potentially affected, not all of them had the, had the Ark of Covenant in it. Uh, and so I, I don't know what a tumor like that would look like, but I can't imagine it was very pretty, but they made them out of gold, so they were worth something. And then the five rats representing the five lords of the five cities, which I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> five rats. Uh, yeah. So they, they put that on that, and they, they put the Ark of the Covenant and these five tumors and five rats on a cart with oxen, and they sort of send it out, and they say, let's see which way it goes. Well, it hits straight back toward the territory of the Israelites. It comes to, um, to the first area where people are working in the field, Israelites, and they see the Ark of the Covenant, and they recognize it, and they know what it is, so they take it and they set it in a field where it stays for a long time, and then um, it, it, the people who are there are blessed by it, but then it gets taken to another location where it stays for many years, up until the time when David sends for it and brings it into Jerusalem, which has become his capital and holy city, okay? So during all of this, and subsequent to that, um, Samuel has stepped up, now that Eli and his sons are dead, stepped up and takes over the role both as priest and as prophet. And really begins to assume the authority and leadership that God wants for him. Now, 
we have a fairly long period of time here when Samuel is the one that is the leader of the country, and everybody recognizes that. But then they get to the place where, uh, in chapter 8, Israel, because they're still fighting against the Philistines, and they keep looking around and saying, all these other countries, when they go to war, they got somebody leading them. Samuel, you're the priest and prophet. You don't actually lead the battles. We want somebody like that. So, um, they, they say, we want a king. I read the portion to you earlier. We want a king. And, and Samuel talks to God. Samuel is offended. He's, my leadership not good enough. And God says, don't be offended. It's not you they're rejecting. It's me. But give them what they want. But tell them what the dangers are. He tells them. They still say, we want a king. And so God tells Samuel, I'm going to send you the right person. And then we have a little story of Saul and one of his servants are sent by his father to find these donkeys that have wandered off. And so they're going through all these different areas, fairly large area, because he tells you what, what regions and what towns they're going through, looking for these donkeys. At a certain point, Samuel says, well, we better go back home because my father's going to start thinking, worrying more about us than he was about the donkeys. And the servant says, in the next town, there is a man of God, a seer, which is another synonymous with prophet. And he is such a man of God, he knows things other people don't know. So let's go see him, and he can tell us, maybe he can tell us where the donkeys are. They go into this town, shorten the version here, they meet Samuel, and God speaks to Samuel and says, this really tall guy here is the one I want you to anoint as the king of Israel. He does. Later on, so you get the anointing of Samuel in chapter 9 and 10, and then Samuel, by God's direction, calls all the people together at Meribah. They have the drawing of the lots to determine who's going to be their king, since they want a king, and they select Saul, who's hiding in the baggage cart. Um, because and he has claimed, I'm, a Benjamin, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, the least of all the tribes, from the least of the clans and the least of the families, etc., but he is chosen to be king. He goes back out to the fields and is working in the fields. I don't think he quite gets what the king thing is yet. <laughs> and then we have a situation where the people of Philistine have attacked a city. And they're at the point, you know, they besiege the city. They're ready to take it over. And the people say, well, we'll surrender to you. But if we surrender to you, what kind of deal are you going to give us? And they go, well, we won't kill you, but we will poke out every one of your right eyes as a sign of our conquest and as a symbol of derision to the Israelites. Because the Philistines and Israelites are enemies. And they go, well, okay, let us see if anybody will come to our help. And if nobody comes to our help pretty quick, then we'll let you do that. Rather than kill everybody. Well, they send out word. And that's the word comes to Saul as he's coming back in from the fields with his oxen. And he gets angry, a righteous anger. This is a godly anger, apparently. And he, that's when he butchers his ox and sends it out and says, anybody who does not respond to this call to defeat the Philistines and save the city, then their oxen will be like this. So they get everybody together. They go out, they win the battle, defeat the Philistines, and Saul's kingship is confirmed in a great celebration. And it's at that point, he apparently gets the idea of what it means to be king. I don't have to go out and you know, have oxen plying the field anymore. And so he begins his kingship. We then have, because there's now a king who is the legal authority, we now, uh, Samuel resigns as judge, meaning he's no longer going to be doing the administrative, legal, you know, dealing with problems kind of stuff. Uh, although at this point, he is still continuing as the prophet of God. Saul's reign then gets characterized in two chapters where we, we get a clear sense that Saul does not have good judgment. Um, in, in a battle that he has, he um, everybody's exhausted. They're winning the battle. They're really exhausted. And they say, can we at least get something to eat before we pursue the enemy anymore? And he says, um, a curse on anyone who has anything touch his lips until this battle's over. Well, his son Jonathan, who'd been out fighting the battle, and it, you know, his uh, armor bearer had defeated a bunch of Philistines, they're going through the woods looking for more Philistines, and there's honey there. And so... Jonathan, not knowing what his father had said, sticks out a staff and gets some honey and tastes it and goes, oh, you know, and it says his eyes brighten. You know, this, he just needed that little bit. Well, later on, when Samuel finds out that Jonathan has eaten when he had said nobody can eat until his battle's over, um, Saul curses his son Jonathan and is getting ready to kill him. 
And all of the other soldiers say, no, you're not. Jonathan hasn't done anything wrong. He didn't even know you said that. And he's one of the best warriors. He's been fighting these battles. You're not going to kill your son. And so Saul, since everybody's against him, says, okay, he backs off. Well, we have several instances like that where Saul's judgment and also his righteousness, his, his willingness to be obedient to God, are clearly in question. All right? Um, then we have God's rejection of Saul. Uh, first, the first instance is because, as I, as I read to you, God uh, doesn't want anybody but the prophet and priest to sacrifice, but Saul does it anyway. And God is angry at Saul for that, and Samuel makes that clear to him. And he basically says, you better shape up, or your kingdom's in danger. Then, later on, God gives very clear instructions that when they defeat the Amalekites, all of the Amalekites and all of their animals are to be killed. Now, we'll go back, we'll talk about the book of Esther later on. Haman, the bad guy in the book of Esther, is an Agagite. Agag is the king of the Amalekites that Saul leaves alive. What happens is Saul doesn't kill everybody. He lets the king live, perhaps because the king might be able to give him some ransom. He keeps all the best animals and everything, so he doesn't destroy everything. The Amalekites had been cursed by God all the way back in the time of the Exodus because as the, as the Israelites were coming up through these lands to get to Israel, the Amalekites kept attacking them, but they wouldn't attack them full forward. They would sneak up and pick off the stragglers. And so they're killing weakened and innocent and you know tired and sick people and without ever having a confrontation, without ever endangering themselves. And so God cursed the Amalekites from back in that time. This, in this case, God told Saul, you were to destroy all of the Amalekites. Well, he doesn't do it, and that's the second way in which he was disobedient to God, and that was it. That's, you know, no more. The fact that he hadn't killed them all, Haman who creates the problem for the Jewish people in, the, in Persia, in the book of Esther, is a descendant of Agag, or Agag, right? He's an Agag, 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 Agag. He's, his ancestor was Agag. <laughs> it's kind of, okay, so, um, well, this is the decline of Saul. He's having so many problems, you know, God has rejected him, and so he starts having uh, evil spirits, and he throws, goes into fits of temper, and, and it's impossible to control. And so the people close to him say, when he goes into one of these really bad tempers, when this spirit is on him, maybe some soothing music would help. And so they say, we need somebody who can play the lyre really beautifully. They say, well, you know, we know somebody that plays the lyre really beautifully. It's David, the son of Jesse. Why don't we get him and ask him to come and play? Well, right before that, let's get something. Right before that, because God had rejected Saul as king, God sent Samuel to Jesse and said, one of his sons is going to be the new king. I want you to go ahead and anoint him now. And he goes through all of his sons, starting with the oldest, you know, and goes on down. And he gets through all the ones that are at the house. And he goes, is this all your sons? Because the Spirit was telling him none of these are right. And he goes, well, I have one more, David. He's a squirt. He's out in the fields taking care of the animals. Uh, we'll bring him in. And God speaks to Samuel and says, this is him. And he anoints him to be the new king. Now, at that point, nothing happens. But he has been officially selected by God through Samuel. Then we have the situation where immediately... This miraculous event where they're looking for somebody to play music for, um, for Saul, and somebody knows about David, and they bring him in, and so he becomes part of the palace. He plays the lyre, for, uh, which is a stringed instrument, of course, for Saul, and it calms him down. And at first, Saul really loves David, and David begins very early on to develop a relationship with one of Saul's uh, Sons, Jonathan, the one he got angry with and threatened, you know, to, to kill earlier on. Then we have the situation in chapter 16, 17, where um, David's brothers are part of the army. They're out fighting the battles. And David, who's back in the palace, he's going out to take them some food and stuff because, you know, you a care package from, from uh, to the front lines. He goes up there and they have a situation where the Philistines have this giant. And if you transfer the, translate the cubits into feet, he's over nine feet tall. 
Um, his armor weighs over 200 pounds. Okay, huge man. And he's out there uh, calling the Israelites to one-on-one -on -one combat. This was true in ancient times, that if you, instead of two armies fighting and, you know, half the people dying, they sometimes would send a champion, and whichever champion won, claimed victory for their army, and that way everybody didn't have to get killed. Well, Goliath is out there calling on the Israelites to send out their champion, and he's been doing this for days. David comes to the front line to bring stuff to his brothers. He hears Goliath taunting the Israelites. And he says, who is this heathen who is, who is um, criticizing the people of the one true God? Why doesn't somebody do something about that? And they're all going, nine feet tall, 200 pound armor, 30 pounds. The head of his, of his uh, the spear was 30 pounds, just the head. It said he had a spear like a, a weaver's rod. If you've ever seen a large loom... That's the piece that goes from one side of the loom to the other, you know, big. David says, well, I'll fight him. <laughs> and they go, get yeah, right. He goes, no, seriously. I have fought lions. I have fought bears when they were attacking my, you know, my, uh, the sheep that I was taking care of, the herds I've been caring for. I can fight him. David has fought these animals with a sling. Now, we think of a sling as being, you know, this little thing, and you, you pick up a rock like a piece of gravel out of here. The slings in those days used rocks that weighed as much as a pound. It was a much bigger deal than what we usually think of if you've ever seen a, a sling. I mean, we used to play with it as kids. So he says, I can fight this guy. Saul tries to dress him in his armor, an adult man's armor. And again, he's only probably 16 or so at this point. And it doesn't work. He can't even walk. And he says, I can't wear this stuff. He goes out. Goliath says, so you send me dogs to fight against me? Children? He's got, David's got a staff and a sling, and he says, well, what are you going to do, hit me with your stick? You know, and then he says, come over here, boy, and I will leave your carcass for the birds. Well, David gets close enough, it says he runs for him, and hits him in the forehead. He falls over, you know, a one-pound rock, you know, hit him in the head. He falls over, David runs up, takes Goliath's own sword, and cuts off his head. David has defeated this giant enemy. And the Israelites, you know, celebrate. Well, when they go back, in, and Saul is really pleased. When they go back into town, Saul hears all the people in Jerusalem singing. And they're saying, how wonderful it is. Saul has killed his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. And all of a sudden, Saul is jealous. He's, this kid is getting more credit than I am. He only killed one man. One nine foot tall man. Um, and so Saul's jealousy starts right there. He begins to have um, alienation, anger against David, even though Jonathan and others keep arguing with him and saying, David hasn't done anything against you. David is loyal to you. David is doing all of this stuff for you, fighting your battles. What is your problem? And Saul goes back and forth. He dithers. And on the one hand, he says, surely I will kill him. And he tells Jonathan and the other, other men to kill him. And they go, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to kill David. And then he says, I'm really sorry. That's all wrong. I'm, no harm is going to come to David. And then the next day, he's going to kill him again. Back and forth. David actually has to flee from Saul. And Jonathan helps him in that. Then we have several instances. This is in chapters 23 to, 30, to, uh, 23 to 26. Where David... His honor, his righteousness gets tested. He has two opportunities to kill Saul. One, because he's running for it with his, with his men. They're hiding in a cave. Saul comes in the cave to use the bathroom. And while Saul is squatting there, David had every opportunity to kill him, but instead he comes up very quietly and just cuts off the hem of his, of his cloak. And then later when Saul leaves, David comes out and he's up on the hillside and he says, Saul... I mean you no harm. If I wanted to kill you, you'd be dead. See? Look at the look at the hem of your robe. All right? He had another opportunity when Saul was asleep in the camp. And David took his spear and his water bottle. And later on, from a distance, said, Do you recognize these? I could have killed you. I, but I don't want to. I don't mean you any harm. Why do you keep doing this to me? There's another case where Nabal, who's this really nasty guy, who's married to a beautiful woman named Abigail, Nabal 
refuses to provide any help to uh, any food or any sustenance to David's men, even though when they had been out in the wilderness that David was controlling, that he made sure that they were all taken care of. Because he wouldn't do that, David is going ready to, to exact justice against this guy because he's horrible. I mean, he's just a nasty guy. And Abigail comes out to meet David and brings along some bread and, and, and uh, dried fruit and things like that and says, these are for your men. Please don't kill my husband. Yeah, he's a horrible guy, but, you know, it's not worthy of you, basically. And David says, you're right, it's not worthy of me, I won't do it. And so he repents of that, of that revenge. So there's several instances there where David has an opportunity to do something that would obviously would seem to, pers to advance his own desires, his own uh, power, etc., and he does not take advantage of it. And he shows his honor before God. Yes? Doesn't Abigail kill him? Kill, kill Nabal? No, Nabal dies. Nabal yeah. just dies. It says he gets sick and dies. She doesn't kill him. And then, but after he dies, David goes back and marries Abigail. She is his second wife. Yes. Okay. But no, Nabal, it just says Nabal got sick and died. Um, God's involved in a lot of stuff. And then David flees to the Philistines because he figures that's the only place he can really get away from Saul. And he makes them think he's working for them all the time. When he goes out on these expeditions, they, they think he's fighting against the, the Israelites, but in fact he's going and fighting against the Moabites and Edomites and other people. And then coming back with all sorts of plunder and all kinds of stuff. He ends up not fighting against the Israelites ever. In fact, some of the generals don't trust him, so they won't let him be involved in the last big fight. He goes back. Philistines and Saul and his military uh, come, come to fight. But right before that, Saul had gone to the witch of Endor and called up the spirit of Samuel to try to get one last blessing or one last instruction. I mean, calling up dead spirits clearly against the Old Testament law. Right? There's a lot in there about not, not approaching mediums, not you know, dealing in the dead spirits and all that kind of stuff. But he does it anyway. They have battle, Philistines and Saul's army. Saul's sons, including Jonathan, are all killed. And uh, Saul himself is, a, is wounded at the point of death, and he asks his armor bearer to kill him. His armor bearer won't do it, so he falls on his own sword, and then his armor bearer falls on his sword. They take Saul's body and his son's bodies, cut off their heads, and nail their bodies up to the walls of Beth Shai, the town. The, the, the men of um, Je Jabesh Gilead go and take the bodies down and give them a decent burial and later on are honored by David for that. Okay? That brings us to the, this, this line brings us to the end of 1 Samuel. I'll go through 2 Samuel a little faster because it's all about David at that point. David reacts not by being overjoyed that his enemy is gone. He goes into grief. He laments the death of Saul. In fact, in the first chapter of 2 Samuel, a man shows up who, and lies, by the way, because there's no indication that he had anything to do with it, he says that he was there when Saul died, and Saul asked him to kill him, so he did. And then he took his crown, and he took his bracelet, and here they are, crown and bracelet. He thinks David is going to reward him because he killed his enemy. David has the guy executed. And so he says, who are you to have killed the anointed of the Lord? Even after all of this, David still is showing respect for Saul. Again, he rewards the men from uh, Jabesh Gilead for having gone and taken the bodies down and given them a decent burial. Um, then David is declared king at Hebron over Judah, just the southern part. But Saul's remaining son, Ishbosheth, is made king. And his general, um, Abner, is, they're still fighting, they're still wanting to defeat David. But more and more and more, the people start going over to David. And then Ishbosheth is, is assassinated. David is declared king over all Israel. And then his reign begins. One of the very first things that we're told he does, and this is in the fifth chapter, he conquers the city of the Jebusites, and, and means of Jerusalem, and makes it his capital. The king of Tyre recognizes David. And remember, that's significant because Tyre is a city that had never been defeated. This is an enemy that could have been dangerous to them. But they recognize David's authority. David then crushes the rest of the Philistine threat and be begins his sort of military efforts. He brings the Ark of the Covenant after many years of it being in a field. He brings it back to Jerusalem. 
And there's the scene where when they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, David strips off his outer garment. He's just, you know, basically in his loincloth kind of thing. And he's dancing before the Ark of the Covenant in joy before the Lord. And his wife, Michael, who is one of Saul's daughters, sees him from a window dancing before the Lord and is, and is mortified. You know, he's stripped down to his shorts. He's dancing before everybody. And in in, in he looks really silly. He's a white guy. White guys can't dance. <laughs> Wasn't actually a white guy. But. You're right. And so Michael later says to him, you know, oh, aren't you proud of yourself? The servants of your servants saw you out there gyrating around looking absolutely ridiculous. And he says, you know, the servants of my servants saw me worshiping before the Lord my God. That's what I was doing. And you should know better. And it says then Michael did not have children. But all of her life. Remember, that's a sign of disple the displeasure of God. So, God then establishes his covenant with David, which we read earlier, through the prophet Nathan, saying, your descendants will sit on the throne. David's victories, he continues these campaigns, again, there's a chart in your book, where he secures all of the boundaries that we showed you in that purple area. He then uh, overcomes all of the different threats at that point to his uh, to, through to his throne. But still, David is showing kindness. Um, he finds out, he asks, are there any heirs of Saul's that I can show respect to? He finds out that one of, uh, that one of the grandsons is actually one of the children of Jonathan called Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, when he was just a child, he, when all of this stuff was happening, his uh, nanny is fleeing, his nurse is fleeing with Mephibosheth, and apparently he falls... He injures both of his legs to the extent that he is he's lame. He's not able to walk. Uh, or it, it doesn't say that exactly. He at least has damage so that he's not able to fully use his legs. David finds out that Mephibosheth is still alive, and he calls and asks him to come. Mephibosheth thinks he's going to get in trouble because his father, his grandfather, was responsible for all this bad stuff. David says, I loved your father, Jonathan, and I respected your grandfather, Saul. I'm, I'm paraphrasing you. And I want to do something for you. And so I'm giving you back all of the land that was personally owned by your grandfather Saul. And you can eat at my table in the palace for the rest of your life. As a way of honoring you and of honoring your family. Not what you would have expected. Given how he had been treated by Saul. Yes? Well, would he have been heir to the throne? Uh, technically, yes. You know, and now, they had not established, recognizing that there was Saul and then there was David, they had not established a, um, a passing down you know, of the throne to family. There, was not, there were not dynasties yet. There hadn't been one. In fact, that's one of the things about why it's important that God said that to David. Is Dave, God promised David that he would have a dynasty, that the house of David would continue. So Saul, there would not have been a precedent where Saul's children or grandchildren could technically claim to be king, although that would have been habitually the case or usually the case in surrounding. You know, usually it was the, the oldest son of a king who became the king. But that had not been established yet in Israel. But he could have made that claim based upon what was the usual in the time. Okay? Um, so David then defeats the Ammonites, Arameans. They get together. Actually, the Ammonites hire the Arameans. The Arameans are from Syria. Um, it's what we know as Syria. And he defeats those challenges, and things are kind of at peace. The army is still out cleaning stuff up and, you know, fighting the last of the Philistines and things like that. David stays home. He goes out on his mirror door. He looks across, and he sees on another mirror door a beautiful woman taking a bath. Don't ever take a bath on your mirror door if there's other mirror doors taller than yours. Okay? That's the principle. But David sees her. She's beautiful. He sends his servants, brings her. He takes advantage of the situation. He's the king. How do you say no to the king? Uh, a king who is well loved. Everybody loves David. Okay? Um, he sleeps with uh, Bathsheba. She becomes pregnant. In order to try to hide it, he, I told you the story already. He calls Uriah in, thinking he'll sleep with Bathsheba, and they'll think it's his son, or his child. Um, Uriah doesn't do it as an act of honor. And so he ends up telling his, his general to make arrangements for Uriah to be killed. Send him to the front at the hardest part of the battle, and then withdraw from him so he'll be killed. And he is. So David is now guilty of not only adultery, but of murder. 
And he then marries Bathsheba in very short order. Yes, Eric. So surely she would have known that oh, there's the castle or there's the kingdom. The palace. Right? There's the palace right next door. I'll just take a bath. And do you think maybe? I mean, obviously it's an unanswerable answerable question, yeah. but maybe she just did it to get into yeah. the palace. Right. I mean, you're right of the Hittite, David the king. You're right of the Hittite, David the king. Um, I don't know. The, the, the scripture doesn't actually attribute any negative motivation to Bathsheba. The indication is that as the king, David's the one who had all the power. You know, he's the one who, could, who, who was responsible for this whole thing. So if there was any of that in there, we're not given that indication. But if, if she didn't have some kind of manipulative thing going on, it would have been the first time in history that <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so, um, all this has happened. And God, Nathan, is then sent by God, and he tells this little story about a rich man and a poor man. The rich man has all these flocks and everything else. The poor man has one little sheep that he has raised, that he feeds from his own, you know, his own plate, and he loves this sheep like a child. The rich man has a friend come visit, and instead of using one of his own animals, he takes the sheep from the poor man. And Nathan says, what do you think should be done to that rich man? And David says, he should be killed! And Nathan said, you are the man. Okay. So, we're out of time. Let me keep going here. And David accepts it. He accepts the sin. His, the son that is born to Bathsheba from this dies. He is in horrendous grief. When the child dies, he gets up, cleans himself up, puts on new clothes, sits down to eat. And his servants say, well, we figured when the child died, he'd be worse. And he said, when the child was still alive, my grief was, you know, appeal to God that he be saved, and now that the child is dead, my grief serves nothing. And so he moves forward, but one of his sons, Absalom, rebels against David's control, rule, you can read all those details, um, and ends up being killed. Actually, they describe Absalom as being the most beautiful man ever, and he had this huge head of hair. They said that whenever he cut it, like once a year he had to cut it, and there was the equivalent of 12 pounds of hair. That's a lot of hair. He's riding through the forest trying to get away from the, the general of David, Joab, and his hair gets caught in the leaves of in the limbs of a tree, and he's hanging there, and Joab comes up and kills him. Even though David had said, Do not harm my son, Absalom, even though he's in rebellion. Then one of David's other sons, Amnon, seduces, rapes his half-sister Tamar, who's the full sister of, um, of Absalom. The story of Absalom's death comes later. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the top, top headings and telling you the stories. Absalom ends up killing Amnon and then running for it. Later on, David lets him come back. Then Absalom revolts, um, is killed in the process. All of these are the ramifications. This is the unfolding of what happened in David's household. These are the troubles of David. All of them related to family because of David's adultery, and then the murder that he committed to uh, cover it up. Then, at the last four chapters, 21 to 24, um, we have sidebar, sort of commentaries on the results of David's um, story, or the results of David's actions. And it's in a chiasm. Remember what a chiasm is from the other classes? The story literally, in the Hebrew, it's constructed so that it makes points going out, and then it makes parallel points coming back. And that's why I've structured it this way. It talks about God's wrath against Israel because of Saul, because of the evil that Saul had done in, in destroying the Gibeonites. He sends three years of famine on Israel. And David appeals, and God relents and lets that go. Then we have a story of the exploits of David's mighty men, these powerful warriors that were fighting battles for him. Then we have David's song of praise for victories granted. Then we have a section of David's last words about God's blessing on he and his house. Then we have another passage about the exploits of the mighty man. We're coming back on the chiasm. And then finally, God's wrath against Israel be, uh, because of David's disobedience. It's not specific about that, but God ends up saying, you got three choices. Do you want to have three years of famine? Do you want to have three months of fleeing from your enemies? Or do you want to have three days of plague? And David doesn't actually choose. And all these are a form of judgment. But God decides three days of plague. And so 70,000 people, I think it's 70,000 people, die uh, from this plague. And that's the end of Samuel. And David is a very old man. He dies very early in 1 Kings. But that is the reign of David. We've run out of time. Any questions? Becky?